Robert Kagan, when you wrote the book Dangerous Nation, you have 26 pages in your bibliography, 500 plus books. Have you read all those? I've certainly read large quantities of, of all of them, yeah. If you had to pick one of those books out that best demonstrated your own philosophy, what would it be? Uh, actually, I'm not sure there is one. I mean, I, what I did was I went through and pulled out a lot of pieces uh, from a lot of different historians writing about specific periods and tried to weave them into a narrative that, quite honestly, I don't think has been, has been done in quite this way before. So th there's not any particular book that I would point to. I was most influenced by a lot of domestic policy books in my discussion of foreign policy. Like? William Freeling's uh, writings about slavery and the onset uh, of the Civil War and the South's view of itself. Uh, which plays a big part in my book, the South as a kind of separate and distinct nation uh, acting very much like a totalitarian power, expansionist in that sense as well, uh, and how the North attempted to contain it. I, I see there's a real similarity uh, between American strategy in the Cold War and the North strategy toward the South before the outbreak of war. Let me read you back what you wrote in your book in the introduction. But it has also been a problem. Americans have often not realized how their expansive tendencies, political, ideological, economic, strategic, and cultural, bump up against and intrude upon other peoples and cultures. They're surprised to learn that others hate them. Why, you know, expand on that? Well, Americans generally, our sense of our history and our sense of ourselves is that we're just sitting here minding our own business, and then somebody comes in and attacks us, and then we have to go out and deal with it. And of course that has happened. But the larger story, I think, of a nation that has been expanding territorially, culturally, economically, strategically, and consistently over 400 years, really, if you go back even before the revolution, uh, we have been expanding into other people's realms. Now, from my point of view, it's to the good in most cases, but I think we don't realize that when we do expand into these realms, we uh, are bumping into somebody else's own ambitions. Before uh, Pearl Harbor, a lot of Americans thought it was a blast from the blue, uh, the Japanese attack. But of course, we had been impinging on Japanese behavior uh, for quite some time. I don't think the Japanese were right, but we as Americans need to be aware of the effect that we have on the other world, on the rest of the world. Not to apologize for it, but be aware of it. You're still living in Brussels. Your wife is still the ambassador to NATO. Uh, we've talked about your European book before, but what about hate right now in Europe? Do you run into it? Well, not personal hate. I, uh, the Europeans are very friendly. European, the Europeans today are very distracted by their own issues. I mean, there's certainly great hostility to the Bush administration. There's great hostility to American foreign policy. There's a real suspicion about America there. But uh, immigration issues, uh, the Islamic populations in Europe, uh, uh, the enlargement of the European Union, questions of Turkey, those are the issues that are consuming Europeans today, not the United States. What has been the impact of the Iraq War on the Muslim population of Europe and in its relationship to their, the governments over there? Well, I mean, I think that it certainly has exacerbated uh, an already existing problem, but I would say it's a small part of it. I mean, the real problem uh, that Muslim immigrants feel in Europe is, is alienation uh, from the countries that they move into and a sense that they're not allowed to uh, live the way they want to live in European culture. And hence we see things like the cartoons. Uh, and there's a reaction against this feeling among uh, Europeans who are not Muslim. And so there's a struggle over identity right now in Europe. And I would say that's the leading cause of Muslim unhappiness in Europe. I got the impression from reading parts of your book that there's another one coming that it is a part of, of two or three part series? Uh, it's only going to be two. It's two volumes. The, the second volume will cover from, from 1900 until roughly the present or, you know, as near as I can get, but certainly up through the Iraq War. What did you try to do in this book that was unusual? Well, I think I focused uh, particularly on the role of ideas in American foreign policy. I focused very closely on the ideas embodied in the Declaration of Independence as shaping American foreign policy and pointing out that America is unlike other nations in that it has no nationalism based on blood and soil. Its only nationalism is adherence to the principles of the Declaration, which has shaped America's attitude towards the world ever since the beginning and made us internationalists at heart. 
what I've mostly sought to do in this book, well, m among other things, is to fight back the myth of isolationism. Uh, we have this sense that we were born in isolation, uh, the Puritan fathers, they just wanted to get away from Europe. And in fact, the opposite is true, even of the Puritan fathers, but uh, all through our history, we have looked outward, uh, made judgments about the world, uh, considered most governments around the world illegitimate compared to our own, and that has heavily shaped our approach to the world. Let me, before we go into some other topics here, bring the audience up to date on you and your background. Now, Donald Kagan and Fred Kagan are who? How do they relate to you? Donald Kagan's my father. He's an uh, ancient historian at Yale. He's been teaching there for, I guess, over 40 years. And uh, Fred Kagan is my younger, smarter brother. Um, he's also uh, a historian. Uh, he's now at the American Enterprise Institute. And, uh, you know, in many respects is the, is the uh, sort of formulator of the idea of, of how you would do a surge in Iraq right now. He's a military historian with tremendous expertise on current and past military issues. And the surge, in your opinion, is good or bad? I think it's good, and I think it's already showing uh, a lot of positive signs, which are not being reported as, as well as they should be. Uh, you've clearly got um, uh, insurgents on the run. You've clearly got uh, uh, Sadr, the, the, the Shia leader, is uh, clearly gone to ground. Uh, and I think the more we uh, press on, I think we're going to see a lot of progress. Your brother Fred, your father Donald, and you signed that letter back in 1998? Yep, and along with a lot of other people. Oh, yeah, but I mean, it was, it's the letter that is often referred to by people who don't like you. <laughs> of which there are many. <laughs> well, it's, the, it's a project for the new American century. Yeah. You and Bill Crystal founded that project. Right. What year? I think it was roughly 1996. What is it? Well, now it's, it's not really uh, in place anymore. What it was, uh, first of all, it was about three people uh, who, who did it. I mean, it's not this massive organization. It was, you could have knocked on a door and found the whole project of the American Century in one room. And the real purpose of our getting it started at that time was to sort of fight against isolationist tendencies in the mid-1990s, and particularly in the Republican Party. Uh, we were prominent supporters of Clinton's war in Bosnia, uh, of Clinton's uh, uh, war in Kosovo, uh, and we were arguing for a, a willingness to use American power in that way on behalf of the Clinton administration and often against Republicans. Uh, we were very concerned with issues about China and China's rise. Russia, NATO enlargement, we were very supportive of. One of the things, but by no means the most significant of our activities, was also to raise uh, alarm bells in along with the Clinton administration, who was saying the same thing about Saddam Hussein uh, and, his, and the threat that he posed in Iraq. In 95, 96, what were you doing? Um, I guess I was uh, finishing up a PhD, actually. I had gone back to school at a very ancient uh, age and uh, got, was getting my PhD at American University at the time. You said there were three people involved in starting Gary up Gary Schmidt is the other one. He's the executive director. He's now at the American Enterprise Institute. Because this group and the, the number of signatures on the letter <clears throat> are 18, yeah. uh, and a, a lot of them went into the Bush administration, um, and I'm going to read a lot of this yeah. so people can be brought up to date that haven't seen it. Um, well, give us some insight as to how it actually came together. I mean, the three of you, yeah. did you have a meeting somewhere? Well, we talked constantly about all kinds of things. And I mean, the other thing about the project uh, that I think people uh, don't quite understand, there was nothing uh, below board, no, nothing nefarious. We did everything in public. We wrote public letters. We wrote public editorials. We wrote public uh, uh, reports. Um, everything we did was out there to see. When, you know, the Clinton administration was very concerned about what to do about Saddam Hussein, they ultimately wound up bombing Iraq for several days, and we were also concerned, and we were urging, wanted to urge the Clinton administration to take firmer action against Saddam, uh, and we gathered as many uh, people who we thought were prominent in the foreign policy community. We had people like Richard Armitage. We had people like Bob Zelik on that letter. Uh, people who are not normally associated with the great cabal. Um, we, had a, we had a pretty broad cross-section of people on that letter, and we could have gotten a lot more. Uh, but we thought that was a good group to, to make the point that we thought that something had to be done about Saddam Hussein. How much involvement did you have in starting the Weekly Standard? A uh, None. That, that was something that, uh, that Bill started along with John Podhoritz, and I came on as a contributing editor, uh, I guess, in its first year. And how long did you do that? I'm still doing that. I'm still a contributing editor at the Weekly Standard and also at the New Republic. What I'm trying to get at with yeah. all this is how this stuff for other people yeah. who have never been involved in this starts. Yeah. Uh, I saw somewhere where Sarah Scaife, 
uh, Foundation, the Olin Foundation, the Bradley Foundation funded the, the uh, project for a new American century. Yeah. Is that right? I, I guess so, yeah. I wasn't involved much in the fundraising, but I'm sure that I thought those sound right, yeah. And this letter that was sent, I mean, if it started in 96, this was in January 26th of 1998, yeah. uh, starts out, Dear Mr. President, and you're talking to Bill Clinton at right. this time. By the way, you have any evidence that he read the letter? I always assume presidents don't read letters that, that get sent to them. And I have no evidence to the contrary. But to put it in a context with 1998, with today, yeah. in, in 2007, we are writing to you because we are convinced that current American policy toward Iraq is not succeeding. And what was the current policy at the time? Well, you know, by 1997 already, it's worth recalling what people do not recall, which is that there had already been a senior American official saying Saddam Hussein had to be removed from power, and that person was Madeleine Albright. Um, the Clinton administration believed that Saddam Hussein was a great threat. They obviously believed fully that he was engaged in building weapons of mass destruction and had extensive programs, which is why they ultimately bombed him. Uh, but they, we felt that they weren't taking strong enough measures to ensure uh, that he was uh, out of power, which was the only, in our view, the only way uh, to be sure uh, that Iraq wouldn't be a menace to the rest of the region. And by the way, I still believe that that's true. Uh, I don't have any reason to think that that was a mistake getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Let me start again. Yeah. We are writing you because we are convinced that the current American policy toward Iraq is not succeeding and that we may soon face a threat in the Middle East more serious than we have known since the end of the Cold War. In your upcoming State of the Union address, you have an opportunity to chart a clear and determined course for meeting this threat. We urge you to seize the opportunity and to enunciate a new strategy that would secure the interests of the U.S. and our friends and allies around the world. That strategy should aim above all at the removal of Saddam Hussein's regime from power. We stand ready to offer our full support in this difficult but necessary endeavor. Did he mention any of this in that State of the Union message? Uh, I don't recall. I mean, over the next... I didn't. I, I should go back and look at all the documentation now. But um, over the course of the next two years, the Clinton administration basically echoed the sentiments of this letter. And let's not forget that the Senate passed a resolution, uh, 98 to nothing, uh, voting 100 million dollars to an opposition in Iraq to overthrow Saddam Hussein. And they did that, I think, at the end of 1998. Um, it was essentially a bipartisan agreement that Saddam Hussein was a major threat that needed to be dealt with. It's just the Clinton administration could not figure out a way to do it. And I'm sure Clinton officials now look back and say it's a good thing we didn't try to do uh, what the Bush administration ultimately wound up doing. But that was our concern at the time. This letter was signed by you, and I, I actually don't even see your name. Yeah, they're your name. But your father and brother's name is not on, on the one that I Yeah, I don't think they signed that letter. I, I didn't remember. Because there was a reference letter. to somebody yeah. that said they signed it. Yeah. Elliot Abrams, who's in the White House right. now. Richard Armitage, who you mentioned earlier, who's not in the State Department anymore, but was. William Bennett. John Bolton, who was UN Secretary, uh, uh, our UN Ambassador. Paula Dobriansky, who was in the State Department yes, at this no. time. Mm -hmm. Francis Fukuyama, who's kind of slid off the war, hasn't he, by, that, by now? Well, he's pretending he never thought it was a good idea to begin with, despite the fact that he signed this letter. <laughs> Zalme Khalilzad, who is going to be our UN Ambassador. Bill Crystal, D Richard Pearl, Peter Rodman, who's in the Defense Department. Donald Rumsfeld, William Snyder Jr., Vin, Vin Weber, Paul Wolfowitz, Jim Woolsey, and Bob Zellick. Zellick was trade representative, number two guy at State Department, Paul Wolfowitz, number two at the Pentagon. The thing that he said about that list, by the way, is it's an extraordinarily broad cross-section of the sort of foreign policy-making establishment in the Republican Party. I mean, you go from people like Bob Zellick to Richard Armitage, uh, you're not talking about one particular wing uh, of Republican foreign policy, you're, you're talking about a broad cross section. But how does it physically work that you, when you had this letter, do you send it out to a bunch of people and say, "Will you sign it"? Uh, we basically, once we had a draft of the letter, we would send it to people. Then they would make comments. You need to, you know, in order to get people on a letter, they have to have some input on it. And so the final draft was a result of everybody who we thought was important to get on the letter having their say. Did it have any impact at the time? None that we felt. No, no. I don't think it ever had any particular impact. We send many letters like this. I mean, if you went through our files, you'd see letters like this on Bosnia, on Kosovo, on China, signed by these people, signed by Democrats. Uh, Jim Woolsey was a Democrat, after all. Um, so that this is, you know, this is one tool that we thought uh, could have some effect, but it was very hard to measure an effect. You know, administrations usually tend to ignore, or at least appear to ignore, uh, what outsiders are telling them.
Let me read some more. And the reason reading it is putting this, trying to put it in context what has happened. Although let me say one thing. I'm sorry. Uh, after we.